Good morning and welcome to this service of worship uh, for Sunday the 3rd of May and uh, recorded in Belmont Manse. Uh, my name is Nigel Craig and I'd like to welcome you if you're viewing this as a member of Belmont Congregation or First Hollywood Congregation or indeed any other uh, church uh, or none at all. Uh, you're very welcome uh, to join us today uh, and I'd like to thank those who have given positive feedback uh, for these services and I pray that the Lord would use us in all of our weaknesses uh, at these difficult times and bring glory to his great name. So let's worship God together. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Our call to worship comes today from 1 Corinthians chapter 4. What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. We pray together. Heavenly Father, we recognise that every good and every perfect gift comes from your generous hand. The gift of life itself, health and vitality, those precious ties of kinship and friendship, the gift of human affection and love. We thank you for the gift of the natural world, declaring your glory and refreshing us in body, mind and spirit. We thank you for the gifts of home and comfort, education and employment, commerce, industry, farming and technology. We thank you for civil society with democratic governance, the judicial system, the National Health Service, police and security, arts and leisure. With the help of your word and spirit, we recognise there is nothing that we have that we did not receive. Consequently, there is no place for pride. All that we have is a gift from you. Father, this is particularly true in the spiritual realm. Grateful as we are for our upbringing, for the most part baptised and raised in the church, and thankful for our present membership of a local congregation, we know that these things in themselves are not enough for us to be in a right relationship with you. In your kindness you have given us your Son, Jesus Christ, who by his perfect life, sacrificial death and powerful resurrection has made it possible for us to be pardoned, accepted and made heirs of eternal life. You have given us your Spirit who enables us to gain Christ, to know and be found in Christ by faith. Father, Son and Holy Spirit, forgive us then for our ingratitude and insane boasting, whether in connection to life before others or life before your face. We know that pride and conceit lead to a whole host of other nasty attitudes, words and actions. So we confess our sin before you now. And we hear these words of challenge and also of assurance from 1 John. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Boys and girls, I'm pleased that you're able to join your mum and dad uh, here uh, to watch this service today. Now, I have a couple of uh, pictures to show to you. And uh, the question that I ask is, do you know these people? Do you know these people? Here's the first one. Do you know who this is? This is Winston Churchill, or at least a model of Winston Churchill, uh, who was Prime Minister during the Second World War. Do you know who this is? Well, this is a picture of Avishna. And as you know, Antonia and I have a dog called Vesir, who is a Vishla. Do you know who this is. You probably don't. This is my nephew, 
Aaron a few years ago. Do you know who this is? I hope your mums and dads do. This is a picture of John Calvin. And he was a reformer or a church leader in Geneva, Switzerland, many hundreds of years ago. And our Presbyterian church was greatly influenced by him. Do you know who this is? Well, this is a picture of my niece, Nora. And finally, do you know who this is? This is a picture of Her Majesty the Queen. Question, do you know these people? I could say, yes, I know the Queen, and yes, I know Nora. But my knowledge of the Queen is slightly different from my knowledge of Nora. I know things about the Queen, but I don't actually know the Queen personally. We've never talked before. We've never had tea together before. I've seen her at a distance. She doesn't know who I am. So I know things about the Queen, but I don't really know the Queen. Now that's different. I know Nora, and she's a lot bigger now. Uh, Nora is my niece, and I can talk to Nora uh, face to face when I'm out in Transylvania, or whenever they come here, or we can speak and over FaceTime and so on. So I can say I really do know Nora because I have a personal friendship and relationship with her. And I want you to think, boys and girls, whenever you come to church or to Sunday school and uh, ministry amongst children, um, you learn lots of things about God from the Bible. So there are many things that you can know about God. But it's not just enough to know things about God and his son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. But it's so, so important that we can say that we know him personally. That is, that God is our father and friend through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit living inside us. And when that's the case, we can say, yes, we really do know God. I hope you can join um, the Zoom Mac later on uh, this afternoon, and we're very thankful to Hannah uh, for organising that. Let us hear God's word as it's written in Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 to 11. Finally, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the real circumcision, who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus to put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness, under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Amen. And we thank God for this word and we pray that he would bless it to us. We pray together. May the God who said, let light shine out of darkness, 
shine in our hearts by his word and spirit to give us the light of the knowledge of his glory and the face of Jesus Christ. Amen. These past few weeks have been characterised by losses and gains. Losses, well, sadly, some people, as you know, have fallen ill with the virus and some people tragically have lost their lives. Some have been bereaved and some have been working under incredibly pressurised conditions. For the rest of the population, we've been coming to terms with lesser losses. Think of our children. There's the loss of significant contact with teachers and other pupils. The loss of activities uh, such as sport, music lessons, uniformed organisations and various church activities. When we consider our young people, and there is the loss of months of valuable educational experience, the loss of the chance to prove themselves in exams and the loss of contact with friends. Personal contact it is, of course. For those who are working age, and there's the loss of stability, security, possibly income, and personal satisfaction that comes from regular employment. For those who are retired, uh, there's the loss of meaningful contact with family, the loss of independence, relying on other people to buy groceries, the loss of that precious time with friends, in coffee shops, in sports clubs, and in church. But I think we're all beginning to realise that there is also a sense in which this is a time of gains, of great gains. There's more time with family, more time around the house and the garden, doing those jobs and uh, seeing through those plans that we've talked about for a long time. There might even be more time for reading the scriptures, for praying and for reflection. A time of loss and a time of gain. Now the Apostle Paul wrote his letter to the Philippians whenever he was imprisoned in Rome, possibly facing execution. In chapter 3, Paul writes about the losses and the gains that he had experienced over his lifetime. We're going to consider these together and with the Holy Spirit's help examine our own lives. First of all, Paul's losses. Generations of children have been enamoured with the story of the very hungry caterpillar. No doubt you know it, with its retro pictures and those little holes for the children to put their fingers through. As you know, it's the story of a caterpillar who hatches from an egg and then it makes its way through all kinds of fruit, chocolate cakes, lollipops, cupcakes, watermelons and so on. And then at the end, or towards the end of the story, you have a very large caterpillar who builds a cocoon around himself and stays in the cocoon for a couple of weeks and after those couple of weeks, eats its way through the cocoon and appears as a beautiful butterfly. Now, the caterpillar probably thought it had all, it all going for him. It probably thought, you know, life can't get any better. He maybe thought he had gained so much, well certainly he had gained an awful lot of weight, but then something happened. He lost his old life and he gained a new life. And the new life was one that went far beyond anything that he ever could have dreamt of. Now let's consider the Apostle Paul's story in that light. In verse 7 of chapter 3, Paul writes, Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Now the supposed gain, which Paul mentions here, is his former life as a devout Jew. But now he was willing to lose all of that for the sake of Christ. Now what might he be talking about here? But if you turn to verses 5 to 6 in this chapter, there are seven things that Paul points out to us. 
Paul was immensely proud of his religious heritage. His credentials were impeccable. In keeping with the law of Moses, he was circumcised on the eighth day. Although he was an honoured Roman citizen and born far away from Jerusalem, his primary identity lay in being part of the ethnic nation of Israel. And as an Israelite, he could say with pride that he was of the tribe of Benjamin. You may remember from the Old Testament that Benjamin was one of Jacob's favourite sons, being born to Rachel, who was Jacob's favourite wife. Later on in the Old Testament, Saul, who is the first king of Israel, comes from the tribe of Benjamin. So it's no wonder that this Jew from Tarsus was called Saul. That is his name before his conversion to Christ, after which he was called Paul. Indeed, at one time, Saul could boast that he was the creme de la creme. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews, in that he belonged to the highly devout and orthodox group of the Pharisees, and was educated at the feet of the renowned Rabbi Gamaliel. And as a Pharisee, he outwardly observed the Jewish laws with perfection. Now to top it all off, as you see there in verse 6, he wasn't just content with keeping the traditions of his fathers, but he was zealous to oppose anyone who would appear to contradict them. And for him, the new Christian movement, the church, was the target of his ire. So to all intents and purposes, Saul of Tarsus thought he had it all. If anyone had any reason to boast, humanly speaking, a reason to be confident in himself, it was Saul. Now elsewhere, um, Paul recognises the blessings of his inheritance. You see that in Romans chapter 9, verses 4 to 5. But here in Philippians 3, he's confessing that for a long time he actually missed the heart of it all. He thought that he was in a right standing before God due to his meticulous observance of the law rather than because of God's grace in Christ. I wonder, are some of us um, like Paul? Maybe we have a glowing CV, and we were born in a decent family, baptised as a child, raised in the church, well-educated, had a good job, with high earnings, maybe a great PB and a half marathon, a wonderful handicap at golf, life's pretty good, or at least it was until coronavirus arrived. Maybe we're the type of people who, although we might not say it, we certainly think it, that we've great confidence in all that we've worked for. We're quite proud of what we've achieved. But I wonder how does God view it all? In the book of the Acts of the Apostles, we read that Paul had a dramatic 180 degree turnaround in his life. It was a radical metanoia, and that's the Greek word for a change of mind or repentance. You see, the things that he had placed so much confidence in, he came to view as worth very little. In fact, it was almost like rubbish, something that could be set to one side, cast aside, compared with the most important thing of all, which he did not have. Paul came to realise, in verse 7, whatever gain I had, I now count as loss for the sake of Christ. Jim Elliot, a famous missionary, once wrote, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. So, what did Paul gain? Well, at the end of verse 8, we read, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. In order that I may gain Christ. Now, this is a bit of a peculiar phrase. In, in a sense, how can you gain a person? What's involved in gaining Christ? Well, in verse 18, rather verse 8, Paul speaks first of all of knowing 
Christ Jesus my Lord. Indeed, he speaks of this as surpassing worth or of surpassing greatness. Or to use the words of Graham Kendrick's hymn, which is based on this passage, knowing you, Jesus, there is no greater thing. But what does it actually mean to know Jesus? Well, obviously, there is a knowledge of who he, who he is and what he has done. There are objective matters of first importance, which one must believe in, in order to be called a Christian, such as a confession that Jesus is Lord, that he's the divine Son of God, that he has come in the flesh and has been born of the Virgin Mary, that he lived a life of sinless perfection, preaching and teaching the kingdom of God, performing miracles, healing the sick, raising the dead, and that he was crucified for our sins, that he died, was buried, and then that he rose from the dead bodily, after which he ascended into heaven, where he now resides at the right hand of God the Father, interceding for us. And there, from heaven, along with the Father, he has poured out the Holy Spirit on the church. And finally, this same Jesus will come again personally to judge the living and the dead and to inaugurate the new heavens and the new earth. Those are creedal statements, basic aspects of what it means to know and to believe Jesus Christ. And yet to simply give mental assent to those doctrines doesn't necessarily mean that we know Jesus. If I may use words from James from another context, even the devils believe these things and tremble. To really know Jesus entails a relationship with him. Paul writes of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, is personal. Now, I shared some examples with the boys and girls earlier in the service of how we can say that we know the Queen, but we don't really know the Queen because we don't know her personally. Uh, we haven't sat down to drink tea with her. She doesn't ring us up on a regular basis. Uh, I could say that I know the Prime Minister, Boris Johnston. That is, I know things about him. But I don't actually know him, for I never attended Eton with him, nor have I played tennis with him. Indeed, if a newly married guy is able to say after his honeymoon that he now really knows his wife, he might be talking about the hours that she spends getting ready before they go out. Or he could be talking about knowing her intimately, having consummated the marriage. In Hebrew, of course, the word to know carries this intimate sense. So, to really know Jesus is both to know what the scripture testifies about him in his person and work, and to know him personally through the powerful movement of the Holy Spirit in our lives. That is, to have our minds renewed and to be persuaded in our wills and enabled to embrace him as he's offered to us in the gospel. That is to receive him into our lives, to rest upon him and him alone for our salvation. So it's probably important this morning, in fact it's not probably important, it is very important for each of us to ask the question, do I know Jesus in that way? And of course, uh, as marriage doesn't end with the honeymoon, uh, so our knowledge and love of Christ progresses and increases beyond our initial reception of him into our lives. And in these verses, Paul goes on to write that he wants to know Christ more and more. And you can see that in verse 10. He wants to experience Christ in a deeper way, to know more of Christ's sufferings and death. Now, Paul's sufferings can't add anything to the vicarious suffering of Christ for his sin, for all that has finished. But Paul's sufferings can be of value in that he can die more and more to his old life of sin. He can experience new fellowship or koinonia with the suffering Christ as he himself suffers. And he can offer his life, his sufferings, and even his death as a sacrifice of praise. And in doing so, experience Christ's power and resurrection in a special way. Ultimately, Paul looks forward to sharing in Christ's resurrection on the last day. Verse 11. So to gain Christ means to know Christ. Additionally, Paul 
says to be in Christ also means to be found in him. At verse 9. And to be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes through the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. We've talked about Paul and his former life. In the past, Paul boasted about his achievements. He boasted about his religiosity, which he thought would be enough to put him right with God which he thought would declare him righteous before God. But now he knows Christ. And he's put aside those foolish notions. After all, no one can be right with God by observing the stipulations of God's law, whether observing the ethnic boundary markers of Judaism, such as circumcision, or through keeping the moral law as summarized in the Ten Commandments. See, the problem is that we can never reach the required standard. We can never claim to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul, and all of our strength. And do we really love our neighbours as ourselves? We fall short. But for Paul, all that had changed. Instead of seeing righteousness or a right standing with God as something to be achieved, Paul now sees it as something that is received through faith in Jesus Christ who lived and died for us. And that's how we are put into a right relationship with God. That's how we're accepted by him. That's how we're pardoned by him, adopted into his family and empowered by the Spirit and promised an eternal inheritance. Not through what we have achieved, but through what we receive by faith, that is receiving Jesus Christ. Before we finish, and there are a couple of things I want to uh, mention, verses 1 to 3 of our passage. In verse 2, Paul uses strong language to warn the Philippian believers of false teaching, which said that to be included in God's people, faith in Christ was not enough. If you were a Gentile, you would have to be circumcised and become a law-observant believer. Paul observes uh, that not only are these people mutilating the flesh, but they're mutilating the gospel. Like dogs, they're barking and making a lot of noise, but they're harming people with their bite and spreading infection like stray dogs in the ancient world. Paul also calls them evil workers. John Calvin comments that under the pretext of building up the church, They did nothing but ruin and destroy everything. For many are busily occupied who would do better to remain idle. And isn't that the case very often with false teaching? People are busily occupied when they would be better remaining idle. In verse 3, Paul reassures the believers that although they mightn't be circumcised in the flesh, they are in the heart. They belong to God's people through Christ, who has cut away and disposed of their uncleanness. They are the ones who worship God by the Spirit of God. And indeed, the message for us is that we need to be very careful not to present a message of Jesus plus something else. To be a Christian, you must have Jesus plus something else. Jesus plus ethnic identity, plus national identity, plus personal achievements, plus good upbringing, plus political ideology. Being a Christian, as we already noted, is gaining Christ, knowing him, and being found in him and his righteousness. For in the end, there's nothing for us to boast about except Jesus. This short letter, as we have already noticed, pulsates with joy. And it's on this note of joy that I would like to draw these thoughts to a conclusion. When we consider what we have achieved or accumulated in life, and compare that with all that we can have in Christ, we can joyfully let go of 
and lose the former and embrace and gain the latter. And to finish with Paul's words, indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you that knowing Jesus is the greatest thing. Thank you that he is our joy and our righteousness. Please would you help us to know that more and more deeply. Father, we pray that you would continue to sustain us during this time. Please would you provide for all our needs. We pray for church family who are on their own. Please be a comfort to them. Please would they know you as a very present help. Help us to be church family towards them and love them well during this time. We pray too for families with children. Please sustain parents with energy and patience. Please help parents who are juggling lots of responsibilities to lean on you. Please would they continue to know your goodness and kindness in all things. Father, we ask that you would guide our government leaders in wisdom. Please would they make decisions that will be safe and good. Please continue to be near those working in the NHS and all other key workers. Please sustain them in all that they do. We ask, Father, that in all things during this time, your name would be glorified and you would be continuing to draw people to yourself. We finish by praying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, 
your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I'd like to thank Hannah for uh, singing. Beautiful piece to us today, All I Once Held Dear, and also for leading us in our prayers for others. Thank you for uh, joining us in our service today, and I hope uh, that you've been blessed, and I encourage you to keep in touch. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace.